All right, okay. All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, so this panel is all about you know, how virtual teams around the world collaborate and contribute to a, an open stack or an open source ecosystem. Um, so we have an esteemed panel here. I'll shortly do an introduction, but before we do that, why are we here? Um, and how many of you have actually been working with the OpenStack community? Okay, a lot of you are. So you know what it is, what it takes to contribute and work with the community. How many of you are remote or virtual? Yeah, about 50% of you. And that's kind of the reality of you know, how things work in the community, right? So we have uh, panel members today. We're going to talk about the challenges and how things work when you're dealing with people from different cultures, from different countries. Uh, the last statistic from uh, OpenStack is we have uh, more than, what, 850 organizations, 3,000 plus developers and contributors across 140 countries speaking different languages in different time zones. How the heck do you get all this working together? That's what we're going to talk about today. And we have uh, some great panel members who have had experience with this sort of thing for a long time. We have uh, folks from Verizon, from Rackspace, uh, from Red Hat, um, and we'll do shortly an introduction. Just to give you logistics-wise, we'll do a little bit of an introduction first, um, and then we'll go through some questions around, or discussions and stories that these folks will share with you, and we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A towards the end. Okay, with that, uh, let me go ahead and um, let's start with introductions of the panel members here, starting with you, Fred. If you could do a very quick one minute, no longer than a minute, uh, who you are, and uh, you know, maybe a 30-second elevator pitch of what you're gonna, you know, what challenges you see in this in this kind of an environment. Um, okay. Yeah, my, my name is Fred Oliveira. I work for Verizon. Uh, I'm located in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, and I've been working on uh, OpenStack for I think about three years at this point. Um, different implementations of stuff. Uh, we're basically trying to transition uh, Verizon from a kind of a legacy mode uh, into some more what dynamic uh, uh, new application style uh, development. Uh, we have uh, development groups uh, all over the, the world. Um, uh, probably our biggest one is in India right now uh, from a remote location, but uh, certainly we'll all scattered all around the uh, uh, the United States and. Uh, uh, I'm actually the only person that's in Waltham with my group. Everybody else is scattered around the, um, the United States. Is there one biggest challenge you can point to before you hand over the mic? Uh, uh, I guess the, the, the biggest challenge is really just uh, making sure that uh, uh, kind of general communications, and, and this is making sure that people are aware of what everybody else is doing. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, kind of we have a follow the sun kind of methodology, and uh, uh, following that model requires keeping people up to date. We don't want to wait uh, 12 to 24 hours for the next uh, communication metric part. Karen? <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm Karen Levenstein. I work at Rackspace. I am the US team lead for the Rackspace private cloud documentation team. Um, and our, the documentation team is actually uh, spread across two continents. Uh, half of us are based out of San Antonio and Austin. The other half of us are based out in uh, Australia. And we support a dev team that covers the UK, the US, many parts of the US, and also Australia. So uh, there's that. And then on, I also am helping to coordinate work on the uh, OpenStack installation guide in uh, as, as the uh, focus team on the guide. Um, t we, t we took a page basically from the networking guide team, which there's a presentation later this afternoon, plug, plug for one of my employees, um, on uh, collaborative documentation. For, but uh, anyway, that is what I do. Challenge. Biggest challenge, right. Um, time zones. Time zones. And time zones. Right. And time zones. <laughs> Same problem. Uh, Grant Shipley. I work at Red Hat, and I am a manager of OpenShift, right? So I'm responsible for, um, you know, the open source project, as well as, you know, um, managing and maintaining integrations across different open source projects like OpenStack. I've been remote uh, for the last six years. I live about 10 minutes from the 
Red Hat headquarters, which is a skyscraper in downtown Raleigh, and I've been into the office about three times. Um, everyone on my team is remote, spread across the world, and it was a big challenge, you know, initially doing that, right? And so a lot of insights there. My biggest challenge is same time zones, like um, scheduling team meetings is an impossibility sometimes. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Beth Cohen, and ironically, Fred and I share an office. <laughs> um, although, not, we didn't. Them in there at the same time. That's correct, right. That's a, yeah. Um, so, I also work for Verizon, and I'm a product manager, um, and I work with uh, nobody that's on my team is uh, located in Waltham. They're scattered all over the world. Um, we have people in. Um, EMEA, LATAM, uh, Asia PAC, um, you know, all over the United States. Sch trying to schedule meetings when we cross six time zones is basically impossible. Um, and I also work with a lot of outside, so I do a lot of customer work um, and working with outside vendors. So, you know, coordinating that stuff is near impossible. I would say my biggest challenge is trust. Um, that the team will work together and produce something. Terrific. Okay, my name is Kamish Pemraju. I'm the moderator for the panel today. I work for Mirantis. Uh, I focus on partnerships within Mirantis. I've been involved with OpenStack, I guess, ever since it started. Um, so I was with Dell prior to this and uh, doing a lot of uh, contribution you know, on the marketing side, on documentation. Today at Mirantis, same way as the other panelists here, we have teams spread out around the globe. We have teams in Russia, in Poland, in the UK, in France, and you know, all over the US. Uh, again, same kind of challenges, you know, how do we work on that? So with that, um, let's kind of get started with uh, some interesting questions here. We'll, we talked about the challenges, uh, so we'll start with you, Beth. Uh, what would you consider is your most successful remote team um, you know, work or project you've been involved with, and what made it successful? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't even remember what I thought of <laughs> at the time. Uh, so I'd say, um, actually, the the project that I'm working on now, um, uh, with Secure Cloud Interconnect, is a product um, that's um, the product one of the product managers for it. And um, uh, Verizon is, uh, let's say, it's a traditional telecom, so it's, um, it's moving toward a mode of becoming more of a, I wouldn't say startup, because it's not a startup, but um, more agile. Um, and uh, we were able to get this project um, out the door in about a year, which for, by Verizon standards is amazingly fast. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think what really did it is uh, very, very good product project management. So we had a couple people who um, really ran those meetings, you know, drove to decisions, um, you know, road herd on the people to make sure that they were actually producing something. Um, and I think that applies to the oh. oh Actually, I have another example, which is that I also was, I, I was one of the people who wrote the uh, OpenStack design, architecture design guide. And um, that was a great experience. And we were from every possible company, every possible, you know, different languages, et cetera. And we came together and really was focused on the goal. So one, one question. Uh, the, the biggest question is, you know, when, when people get together, usually they are not people that have worked together in the past, right? I mean, these are not long-term colleagues that have been working together for a long time. And when you had the successful you know, project that you're, you're talking about, were these people that are all new that came together for the first time? And if so, how did that bonding occur and, and what made it you know, successful? That's a great question. And in fact, the, the, for the uh, architecture book, um, we had nobody had ever actually met in person. We were all coming from different companies. Uh, we had never worked together as a team. Um, we will not again, uh, unlikely. Although every time I meet any of them in the <laughs> in the meetup here, I'm like, oh, long lost buddies. So I think I think the real key is is you really have to work on on bonding. Um, the team together. So there's there's some standard methods of you know it's called storming norm you know form what was it called uh, 
forming, storming, norming, and performing. Um, and, and I can't tell you that that really does work. You really have to go through those stages. Um, and, you ha and, you, and, and I think just understanding that that is something that you need to do to get through to create a team is really important, just understanding that process. So when you're busy yelling at each other because, you know, you didn't produce the thing that you promised, you know, understand, yeah, this too will will pass. <laughs> Let's ask Grant, because the, the interesting thing with uh, Grant's work is he's, he's not doing OpenStack, he's doing OpenShift, which is another open source project. So interesting insights you want to share, Grant, when you have two different open source projects trying to collaborate with each other. How does that work? It's, it's basically the same. You know, I, I don't, you know, I think the key to being successful with any remote distributed team is even if people are in the office, we treat everyone um, the same as a remote employee, right? And so even if there's a small cluster of people, uh, we never schedule conference rooms or anything like that, right? We, we have everyone use the same media all the time for communication, um, whether that's IRC or, or Google Hangouts or, or Skype or whatever the case may be. It's important that everyone working uses the same media. And so w when we interact with other open source projects, we use the, the media communication vehicle that, that they use, right? And, and that's very key for us. So, um, so you're, you're working with the documentation, right? So how is, I think you'll work with development teams as well, is that true? Yeah, um, our documentation team at yeah. uh, Rackspace Private Cloud, we work directly with the developers to build our documentation. So in your, in your experience, uh, again, successful project, and how, how is documentation teams different from any other contribution, like code contributions, in your opinion? I would argue that documentation isn't that much different necessarily. I th well, the main uh, the main success that we have as far as working with, say, development teams is um, ensuring that we have good ways of uh, asynchronous communication. Since not everybody can be there, not everybody can be at every demo. Um, so, so things that we've had real success with is, um, for instance, scheduling uh, recording demos. So like video recording a demo, uh, if, if like the development team has some code they need to show off or a new feature, that way the team on the other side of the planet can actually watch the, the demo as if they were there. Um, really, being, uh, really being committed to arranging meeting times. I mean, even though you can't have, uh, even though eventually somebody's gonna be inconvenienced, you know, somebody's gonna have to put in a late night or somebody else is gonna have to put in an early morning. You, you kind of have to accept that and just be committed to that to make sure that people get the face time and the talk time that they need. Um, really with documentation, and in some ways, there are certain ways that it lends itself to asynchronous development that like you can write the doc and then hand it off, you know, when, you, when you're going to bed, for instance, you, you at the end, or at the end of your day, you're handing it off to the, to the other part of the team to continue to work on or to review. And then when you come back the next day, you can hand off it again. But I, I don't know, I don't necessarily see that as different from code. So what about language barriers? Now, documentation in particular is kind of interesting. And I, I don't know if OpenStack has documentation in different languages, is that? Uh, there is translation. I have not personally been involved in, tra in the translation effort, so I can't really speak to it. Yeah. Um, but they've, I know that the documentation team for OpenStack has had to develop tools and tool chains to make sure that stuff gets translated. And what about English barriers in, in other countries? How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, you know, the one thing that we run into is that the Australians and the Americans spell things differently. <laughs> um, and you know, sometimes, and I, we, you, you just kind of have to agree on what you're going to standardize on. I mean, we agree, we generally agree to standardize on American spelling, which means that sometimes the Americans, when we edit, we have to take out some U's and change some S's to Z's. Um, but uh, it, it's you, you just sort of have to find a standard and stick to it. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's get to Fred. Yeah. Um, same question, successful projects, uh, and how do you, and specifically, I want to ask you more about cultural issues mm. that you might have run into as you deal with global teams around the world. Yeah, so I, I think there's been a, a, I guess, interesting thing about the, in, in detail, the, uh, um, I guess our, our most successful project is we have a, uh, a management uh, addition we're adding to the OpenStack environment and from an or orchestration perspective. Uh, and developing that in um, been uh, interesting in the sense of uh, 
building up a new team. And I think as you should describe it, there's nobody really knows each other and what their each other's capabilities are. Uh, so there's a you got a bit of a, a trust factor, uh, and we don't want to be in the mode of uh, kind of one person developing a you know a, a design specification, handing it off. We really want a, co a collaborative environment. Uh, so there there really is a, uh, a at least a, a mode of having to, in, in some sense, inconvenience everybody uh, in scheduling meetings uh, at offsetting times so that everybody has to be up at different times at some point. Um, but from a kind of a cultural perspective, I think the it, kind of a, what I've seen at least is uh, uh, depend from um, some of the Indian uh, group we've been developing, uh, they're kind of a, a used to kind of accepting a design document and then developing it from the design and not necessarily questioning some of the design decisions that were made uh, where we want, you know, they're as intelligent as anybody else and have experiences as anybody else. And we want to have uh, feedback as to what uh, we're doing. And so instilling the, the ability for them to question what was proposed and uh, suggest alternatives is probably the thing we're trying to nurture more and, and uh, get them to do uh, more in this project. So that's a good segue. So I'm going to throw this open to the panel. Anyone can answer this. Um, so typically, if you're, if you're dealing with these kinds of remote teams, they are typically leaderless. Right? There is no one single, and tell me if I'm wrong, but you're dealing with collaboration of teams and you know, kind of designs emerge in some cases. In some cases, somebody is driving the design. So what's your opinion or recommendation? Uh, do you recommend a single leader that kind of drives the whole agenda and kind of comes up with the blueprint and everybody follows? Or do you recommend more of a, hey, let's collaborate and, and do things and kind of muddle through stuff? Who wants to take that one? I'll at least give a, an initial things. Uh, so I, I think there needs to be somebody with a, kind of a, a vision of where this thing should go. Um, if you have a, a committee that's just completely open to making suggestions, uh, often doesn't reach a kind of a, uh, I guess, a, a clear path very quickly. Um, and so I think there's, you, you want uh, somebody who can describe what the, the vision, where they're going, uh, can also act as a moderator. Uh, but I think the you know that person or kind of group small group people has to be, wants to be very open and, and uh, solicit uh, feedback for ideas and alternatives uh, and work with that for a time. Yeah, so I'd like I'd like to, to add to that. Um, so I'm uh, I also teach at University of Phoenix, which is a completely online school, and uh, every single one of the classes requires a group project and this is online so these people are all over the world etc and it's all asynchronous um, so there's no they never talk to each other um, and what I find is and these are again leaderless teams um, and what I find is the most successful teams actually have uh, either somebody who naturally steps up or a rot actually even better is a rotating leader so that everybody feels like they, they can become a leader during during the the pace of the course of the project. Um, so completely leaderless tends to kind of fall into, you know, sort of nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, the worry, the, the challenge with leaderless is it could just muddle through and nothing gets done in the end because everybody has their agenda or things that they want to push. Um, so on, on that note, I think we should circle back to OpenStack because we've been talking in general terms. Um, so again, I'll throw this open to the, to the panel. What is unique about OpenStack? And, and you've been working with OpenStack teams, I'm assuming. Um, how is that different from any other internal project you might be doing uh, with distributed teams? What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Who wants to take it? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure there's, uh, well, I'll say, there's a huge difference between the way Verizon has done some things in, in the path and past and uh, Howard kind of approaching the OpenStack environment. Uh, in the sense, it's very, in kind of legacy uh, Verizon, it's very much a waterfall model, and you plan what you're going to do a year from now. Uh, and uh, uh, six months from now, you kind of reestablish that because you're not making any progress on that goal. Um, so I think the biggest change in that is to make a lot more short-term um, milestones, uh, have uh, deliverables at those milestones that you can do that are short-term uh, to 
a month or three months, depending on what uh, kind of milestones you can do, uh, and, and have kind of rapid turn as to what the requirements really are at, at any one point and be able to adapt to the uh, change in circumstance uh, over time. So I'll ask uh, Grant, um, uh, you know, because Grant is doing OpenShift uh, and you've been dealing with a couple of different open source teams, one OpenShift and the other OpenStack, what do you see different or unique or different about OpenStack uh, as an open source community and open source project? Yeah, so I think all pure open source projects are pretty similar, right? Um, and the reason developers are attracted to them is because maybe they are not fortunate enough to be able to work on OpenStack or, or OpenShift during the day. And so they you know, love software development, so they begin to do it in the evening. And regardless of the project that you decide you want to contribute to, there's you know, a couple of steps that you take. One is establishing relationships and establishing your credibility, right? To one day get commit access uh, instead of just you know, submitting um, you know, pull requests or something like that. And, you know, to come back to the leadership question, I think in most open source projects, the leadership kind of, for the most part, except in very, very large open source project, works itself out through commit access, right? Once you gain the trust of the other developers on the project, you're granted that role. What's different with open source projects with a lot of company interest behind it, which we see a lot, is you know, you may not be working on the specific feature you want to. You may be working on the feature that your boss is paying you to work on. And, and so that's a little different as well. The political landscape in these, you know, huge open source projects is, is vastly different as well. Um, in that you, you know, you're, you're working with a lot of companies that may be your, your enemy during the day, but frenemy when you're working on OpenStack, right? Because you're all trying to get the OpenStack project to the, to the next best state, right? And so you're working with, with people that would love nothing more than to put your company out of business, right? But you're working on this feature together and collaborating and best of friends, right? And so it's really interesting. Uh, so I'd like to add to that that you do have to be very careful. Um, so the I'm I'm working on the on the telecom working committee, and you know all of our rivals are on that committee, and and so we have to be. I mean I have to be careful about what I say and what I can't say, and what I can share and what I can't share. So and I'm sure that and, and I know that's true for all of these OpenStack. Uh, projects, um, and and as you mentioned, I I've also seen um, the conflict between you know what what the company wants to put what the feature set that the company wants to promote and the feature set that the community wants to promote is not always in in sync. So that's that's actually a big issue. Yeah, I, that's, uh, that that is a tension that that we in um, in private cloud deal with a lot. It, partly because uh, for one thing. Uh, those of us who are writers on it, I mean, part of our job description is, in fact, you will work on private cloud docs and you'll work on OpenStack docs. You'll be a member of the OpenStack community. And also, our um, Ansible deployment project, which is now community, began life as a Rackspace thing. And so there's, there's the tension between, as you say, like what the business wants you to do versus what the, what is, what the community wants. And uh, I mean, we really do have a foot in both camps. I mean, my, my boss, who is sitting over there, uh, she, she is also with our, the OpenStack Docs PTL. I mean, that gives you an idea of just how much we, you know, we walk the line there. So it's, it's, it's always a juggling act, I find. And, you know, and the good side of it, though, is that you always have something to do because when the internal project is maybe in a slow planning period, you can switch gears and work on OpenStack for a while, and it it it, it keeps you know it keeps you fresh in both directions. I think. So I want to go back and touch on the leadership question earlier. It's it's if you look at the OpenStack community, it's not like there are no leaders. There are PTLs for technical projects. Over the last three or four years, there's been this whole question about where is OpenStack heading. Right, and and as a result of that, and and the dynamics that some of the panel members have been talking about, which is companies trying to push their agendas, you know, big companies having a cloud, you know, that we don't want that in the community, right? Uh, at the same time, there was kind of no roadmap or no product management in the traditional sense that was going on in the community, and now, I think this summit, I believe, right, we started the product management enterprise committee, which is really all about 
you know, determining what the future direction of OpenStack is. What are the features we should prioritize on? Not what company X says or what, what y, company Y says, right? So, that's, so there is leadership, right? It's not like it's a leader, leaderless community. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's continue with a few other kind of tricky questions here. Um, so if not everybody is pulling their weight, right? So we are, we are talking about a, a community of folks that are working together. There's some who want to really push their weight around, some who don't contribute. So how do you kind of deal with that kind of a dynamic? Um, let's start with Beth, you know, if you could share some thoughts there. Yeah, um, that, so that's, that's a huge issue. Um, so what I find with, and this is applies to me, but it applies to any, and I think any team, is that, when, first of all, if you're not pulling your weight and you're just coasting through, do not think that the other team members um, aren't aware of this. <laughs> and they will resent it. Uh, very greatly and so my advice is um, you know if the if the team member is really not there cut them out you know that's that's their problem that's not your problem um, but sometimes it's a big problem because um, you know they you know they've committed to a key piece and they've let the team down and I, and I find that when this happens there's a huge sense of disappointment um, and resentment. So, uh, you know, my advice is, as a, you know, as a person who's joining a team, be sincere and, you know, commit to what you can commit to and deliver. Um, because you will get a bad reputation in the community if you're not delivering. And just, just to add to that, it's okay if you, you can't follow through. Mistakes happen sometimes. Just let people know as soon as you know, right? That's the most important part in any project. We, we expect failure and, in fact, you know, failure is good. The more you fail, the better the next version is, right? Um, but just be honest and, and truthful about it and let people know. Yeah, especially since, um, you know, OpenStack has a six-month, uh, you know, cycle of cadence. If things don't come through, then the project is not happening, right? I mean, you, you, you get a half-baked project. We've seen this happen with Neutron. How many of you use, have been, you know, kind of following the Neutron debacle over the last year? So it's going back and forth, and I think finally in Kilo, it seems to have reached some level of maturity, but, but it kind of, yeah, it's arguable. So, I mean, I think Neutron is a great example of where things can go off track and people kind of doing things on their own or pushing their own agendas and stuff. Uh, but getting back to the point here, right, uh, let me kind of hear from other, other panelists here. Uh, people are not pulling their weight or not contributing. Uh, Karen, uh, in documentation, for example, somebody's supposed to do something, they don't come through. You know, it's a similar problem. It's if you find that somebody has committed to, you know, work on a specific chapter, work on a specific document, a specific feature or whatever, and they, they can't deliver, you know, it, as Beth says, I mean, eventually you have to say, look, fish or cut bait here, you know. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, really, this, is, this, is, this also loops back to just communication, really, is, you know, both whoever has taken the leadership role and also the people who are delivering have to set expectations. It's one thing to say, you know, to say, yes, I will do the thing, and then drop it without a word. But it's another thing if you say, yes, I will do the thing, and then maybe a few weeks later you come back and you're like, okay, look, I have gotten way overbooked here. I need to prioritize. How can I reallocate this? I mean, that's that's the kind of communication you want from people, and if you don't get it, you're, they're they're not going to be a useful member of the team. It's an interesting dynamic because you know in a traditional environment, it's your boss and doing a review of your performance. It's not so in a, in a community. You're kind of getting reviewed by everybody in the team, right? I mean, if you don't pull your weight, if you don't contribute, if you don't do what you promise, then your karma points will catch up with you at some point and you'll be ejected like a virus, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it kind of happens automatically, which is kind of interesting in one way, uh, which also means that you have to be really honest about what you can and cannot do in a community, uh, because word spreads very quickly, and everybody says, oh, that guy, don't deal with him anymore, right? Uh, Fred, what do you think? Uh, wh what have you seen in your experience? You know, that, again, I, I don't have much more to add to what the other people have said. I think that's exactly right, is that if, be honest about what you can contribute, uh, and if it changes over time that you can't contribute as much as you expected, just let people know. And then it, I think it's very fair. That the community notices very quickly uh, if you don't produce. Because you have uh, communications lines, you know, if they're open and everybody's communicating. But then there are also situations where somebody goes completely off track. 
for whatever reason. You know, maybe they don't have the skills or you know, maybe they were told by their boss, go do something else. That, 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 that does happen, right? Uh, so how do you deal with that? What are some examples that you guys might have seen? Uh, can you point to some concrete examples from your experience of how you dealt with that? Uh, so <laughs> um, I, I will tell the example. This was a team from hell. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, it started out as a five-person team, and then three of them dropped, and it was, got down to two people. And um, they were each calling me, telling me that the other person was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and that they couldn't, you know, and, and they had, each one had like this totally different idea about what they wanted to do. So in the end, actually, they handed in two pieces of work. <laughs> I would say that was the absolute nadir of teamwork. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I, I have four kids at home, and... <laughs> Sometimes I look forward to going down to deal with them because their problems are more adult than some of the other problems you see in the community sometimes. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of different personality types, especially that's attracted to open source projects. And honestly, it, it just takes time to get used to it and how to react to each one uh, specifically on a team because everyone's different, right? And it's a challenge. There's no magic bullet. I mean, shit happens no matter what what project you're on. I will say in like a community-based open source project, um, if you're not pulling your weight, it may be a little bit longer than in a traditional office environment before someone notices, but the reaction is typically much quicker and you can never repair the, uh, the trust issue that you failed with. Whereas in a traditional office environment working on a product team, you know, if you completely screw up, chances are you're not going to get fired, right? But it's not really the case in, in open source projects um, because so much relies on trust because you are distributed. You don't, you don't see them every day, right? And so people just expect you to, to deliver on, on what you're committed to. Okay, uh, we're getting to Q&A time in a few minutes here. Uh, but uh, there's another question that comes to mind. You know, we talk about communication, keeping these lines open, and having all these different media types where people want to communicate. But some people, by nature, are not people that want to come out and talk or communicate in any, any form, right? Uh, but they're great, greatly skilled folks. They know they can do their job. Um, so the challenge here is these folks are somewhere remote on the other side of the world. They don't want to get on, you know, Skype or whatever, you know, Google Hangouts. And they, even if they do, they'll probably say one word because of, you know, language barriers or what have you. So, it, it, how do you how do you kind of cull these folks out and keep the communication flowing? Have you encountered uh, people like that? At least I have. So I just want to hear your thoughts and on how how you have handled those those kinds of things. Fred, you want to take that? You say it. I I'm not really sure you need to or want to call them out because they can produce some wonderful work. Yeah. Uh, but I think it, it requires, you know, uh, uh, at least some effort to try and get them to uh, minimal communication, but that might require some kind of a, okay, just uh, write down a change log of what you did for the last week. Uh, and then at least you could have go, somebody else go back and look at what uh, happened. Uh, but I think it, it's, if they are producing but not communicating, uh, it, you're kind of right on the edge as to whether it's useful or not. But uh, in certain circumstances, it is still useful work. It's just uh, you have to somehow convince them to do at least a, a bit of communication. Right. One, one other question. Um, so nowadays we have you know video that is so easy to get onto. You know whether it's Google Hangouts or Skype or what have you. Has that made any difference in 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 terms of better teamwork or <laughs> Do people use it? Um, well, I, I will say at Rackspace, we have a video conferencing system that we use extensively. And honestly, I think it's made a huge difference, uh, especially because we are so distributed. And I mean, there's for, it, our docs team every week, we have an, a, a meeting that's last thing in the day for the US, first thing in the day for Australia. And that little half hour or so that we have to actually chat and see each other's faces is really helpful. I mean, it really, it, it it is a bonding moment, if I can say that. I mean, and you know, there's there's always like this sort of five minute thing at the very end of the meeting after we've gotten through all the business where everything kind of goes off the rails and we get silly and it's it's fun. I mean, it, and, and you need kind of that kind of interaction. And like for our um, the development team, 
for, our, for private cloud, they have regularly scheduled just video hangouts where it's like it's not a meeting. It's just everybody plugs into their video client and they're all there on their headphones and whatnot and you can sort of sit and chat. And it's like being in you know, a room with a whole bunch of people. You know, you have casual conversations. You can ask questions, not just over IRC, but just like verbally. And I think it makes a huge difference personally. At least in my experience, it's been very beneficial. Yeah, what do the other other folks think here? There are some some folks who don't want to show their faces on video. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so, uh, ironically, Verizon kind of flunks video. Uh, we have we have a telepresence room which um, I have used, and it's actually really wonderful. But apparently, it's like totally booked, and I never see anybody in the room. Um, so mostly, we use tele uh, you know teleconference and IM. And what I find is, first of all, people never um, introduce themselves at the beginning of the IM, so you have to guess what they sound like. Um, and they're usually doing, we're, so we're, we're talking, you know, teleconference, and frequently we do by consensus, so there's like 15 or 20 people on these calls, um, and probably half of them are busy doing something else. Um, and, then, and, and then there's these side conversations in IM going on, so it, it can be very, very confusing and, and um, you know, very challenging for people who, you know, can't multitask. Um, and, and, and this applies to the OpenStack. The, the IRCs drive me totally bonkers. I, I actually have a hard time following them. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, maybe a year ago, I would come to a conference like this and meet someone, introduce myself, that introduced themselves. Turns out we'd been working together on a daily basis, you know, for years, but we had never seen or, or known what each other looked like. Um, and just recently, we started using video conferencing for everything, right? And, and that has made a big difference. Sometimes we still chat on RC when we're on video conference. It's really weird. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a steep learning curve. But yeah, I would say it's harder for like um, if you're all at the same company, employees at the same company is very easy. Um, but if you hop on a video conference with with a collaborator that works at a different company, there's some challenges associated with that. And what are you going to use, right? Is it Google Hangouts? Is it Try WebEx? Working with anybody from Microsoft. <laughs> 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 but, but I would say it's made a huge difference. It, you know, to come back to what she said, it, it does make us feel, you know, more like a team because we're all remote. We'll see something in the background of their office at, at home and we'll joke about it and laugh about it. One time I showed up to a video conference last week uh, wearing a full tuxedo, right? Just to, <laughs> just to be s silly and stupid, right? And so because we don't have this day-to-day -day office face-to-face -face interaction, uh, we value those okay, times uh, more. I think we need to get to questions here. Um, so I, uh, one story I quickly wanted to share. I have a, uh, a colleague who works in uh, North Carolina and uh, whenever I get on the video conference with him, he has, this, he has a cat sitting on his head, literally. I mean, it's staring at me, and I'm like, I'm not looking at Nick anymore. I'm looking at this cat. And says, get that cat off of, off of your head, right? I mean, anyway, so we have, a, we have a, you know, about three minutes, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes for questions. So if you could come up to the mic, uh, if you have any questions for the panelists, that would be great. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> You touched on this at the beginning, but I would like you to go a little deeper, if you can, about the, you know, what happens when you're participating in a project, the project's going in a certain direction, but your company wants to have you push things in a certain way. Um, and then the, the dichotomy between having a project manager in the business world and the open source model where there is no one guy in charge of everything is really more collaborative and we all decide together? I can take that. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with the company cultures that you're coming from too. So as it so happens, Verizon's a very collaborative culture. So um, I think although we're kind of new to open source, uh, I'd say the, the collaborative nature of the, the way the company does business is actually very conducive to open source. But that's not always true. There's other companies that are very hierarchical, and, and that is, it does become a clash. Definitely has been a problem. Uh, I, can, I won't name names, but <laughs> definitely, yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, I wanted to ask about more like details how you organize the, organize the communication during meetings because um, 
It looks like you sometimes need uh, certain rules and do you have the onboarding process for this meeting participants with specific set of rules you use into video conferencing or do you have a moderator who tries to enforce these policies? How do you work with this? Always have an agenda, always have a moderator. It, it may not even be the same moderator every time, but for the love of God, have an agenda because there's nothing worse than a whole bunch of people getting on a video conference and all just kind of staring at each other or everybody just talking in no particular direction. And there has to be a moderator because somebody has to keep things. Amen, amen to that. That's, yeah. that's, I think if there's one takeaway from this whole discussion today, have an agenda, have a moderator. That's the only way these things can work. We have to stop here, unfortunately. Uh, you can certainly talk to the panelists um, after. We have about a 10-minute break now. Uh, so thank you so much for the, mo for the panelists uh, for joining us today. And thank you all for joining. Let's give them.